Hello, beautiful people of the internet. How are you doing today? My name is Jackie and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today in this video I am going to discuss all of the books that I read in September and October. Now, I did not film a September wrap-up because I only read four books that month. However, then in October I read nine books, which means I now have 13 books to discuss in one video, which is a lot. I'm gonna try to review these books quickly so we're not here for an eternity. Also, several of these books I featured in other videos, so I will definitely link those if there's one you want to hear more about. So my statistics for the last two months. In September I read 1,554 pages and then in October I read 3,100 pages for a grand total of 4,654 pages over the last two months. Additionally, in September and October, my average rating was 3.62 stars out of five. We have a lot of books to discuss today, so I think let's just dive right in. So the first book I read was also my least favorite. I read The Island by Adrienne McKinty and I ended up giving this two stars. This book I think just ended up not being for me. I read The Chain by Adrienne McKinty and I think I gave that either four or four and a half stars. I really enjoyed it. And this book just wasn't it for me. I feel like though this book is advertised as a thriller, it to me borders on horror. It's very disturbing, violent, and also quite strange. I don't really like any of those adjectives. This book follows a blended family who are on vacation in Australia. They want to take the children to see wildlife and so when they meet this man he says that they can come to visit his family's island. This island is very isolated and is inhabited by members of this extended family and while the main characters are on this island, something goes terribly wrong and now they are told they are not allowed to leave. If you like twisted and messed up books, I think this would be a good book for you. It was very disturbing. There was a lot of violence. It was kind of gross. And the family that lives on this island are almost like a cult. <laughs> They're not a normal family by any means. I think my problem with this book is, like I said, I personally think it leans more horror than thriller because in my opinion I think a thriller needs something a little more surprising to happen. I was never really surprised by where the plot was going and again it was just so dark, messed up, and violent. I can tolerate some violence in a books but I feel like if a book is going to be really violent, I want it to also have some really good clever plot twists or something to make the violence worth it, in my opinion, and that just didn't happen here. Next, I read A Beautiful Blue Death by Charles Finch, the first in his Charles Lennox murder mystery series. I ended up giving this book four stars. I did quite enjoy it. It's not a new all-time favorite by any means, but I think I got what I wanted out of it. This is a historical mystery series set in the Victorian era in London. The main character, Charles Lennox, is a man of means. He comes from a wealthy background and he is also very good at solving mysteries. His next door neighbor and childhood best friend, Lady Jane, asks him to help her. A former servant of hers has just died mysteriously and so Lady Jane wants Lennox to look into her death to find out who killed her. I think I suspected every character at one point of being the murderer, so when we found out who actually was responsible, I wasn't surprised. I was just kind of like, yeah, that makes sense to me. So there wasn't really any shock factor, but I think this was a very easy and enjoyable historical mystery read. It did not take me very long to read at all. So if you are looking for an easy breezy historical mystery wreck, I think this is a good book to pick up. I will be continuing the series. There are like 
13 books in this series, so I will definitely have plenty of reading material here. I'm going to read the next book this month, actually. So all in all, a pretty enjoyable book. Next, I read a classic, North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. I ended up giving this book four stars. Now, the reason I originally wanted to read North and South is because I've heard people describe it as the socialist version of Pride and Prejudice, and that description just immediately piqued my interest. After reading this book, I can say I totally understand why people compare it to Pride and Prejudice. They are very different in certain ways. I think their vibes and overall tone are different, but there are certain plot elements that are very similar between between the two novels. So the main character of North and South is a young woman named Margaret Hale. Her father ends up leaving his job in the church and moving their family to Milton, a fictional manufacturing city in the north of England inspired by Manchester. Margaret experiences a lot of culture shock when she moves from the south of England to the north, and originally she does not have a very positive impression of Milton or its inhabitants. And she also does not like one of her father's new friends, John Thornton, a local factory owner. However, Margaret ends up questioning her preconceived notions about Milton as time goes on and she gets to know Thornton and other residents of the city. Like Pride and Prejudice, this book includes a enemies to lovers romance, and I did enjoy the romance overall, not on the same level as Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy because they are just the greatest fictional relationship of all time, in my opinion, but I did really like the relationship in this book because, like Pride and Prejudice, I think the relationship helped these two characters expand their worldview and become better people. I just really enjoyed that. North and South is tonally very different from Pride and Prejudice, and I don't know exactly how to describe it. North and South, to me, reads very much like the Victorian classic it is, and I don't know exactly how to describe it, but I personally feel like Victorian classics just have this certain vibe to them. I think they definitely are a lot more serious and darker than Jane Austen's works, and though Jane Austen did include social commentary in her works. I think Victorian classics are a little more upfront with it and not as lighthearted. Victorian classics also a lot of times just include, in my opinion, kind of strange subplots and plot elements. There is a part in North and South where a woman references that her neighbor stole her cat and murdered the cat as part of a pagan ritual. And none of the characters in this book think that's weird. <laughs> like, if somebody came to me and said that, I would have questions. But they just accept it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully readers of Victorian classics understand what I'm trying to say here. I just feel like they all have that certain vibe to them. Like, it's a little bit darker, it's very socially conscious, and sometimes just really weird things happen for no reason. That's kind of the vibe that I was getting from this book. I will say, though, Margaret's cousin, I forget what her first name was, she totally reminded me of a character that might appear in a Jane Austen novel. I definitely felt like the work was kind of poking fun at her in a humorous way. So that also gave me Jane Austen vibes. I think one of the complaints I do have about this book and why I didn't give it a full five stars is I felt like some elements of the plot I wish they had been developed a little more, particularly the storyline involving Leonard's, I believe his name was. I kind of felt like his character just appeared out of nowhere and then this really big thing happens and then that subplot is just over with in the matter of three chapters, I think. 
If I were writing the book, I would have set this up much earlier. It kind of gave me a little bit of whiplash that this was a big deal all of a sudden. And yeah, I just think there are some things that I wish they had been introduced earlier in the book if they were going to end up being so important. I did enjoy this book and I would really like to watch the North and South miniseries. I see gifs of it all over Tumblr and just, you know, the Tumblr period drama girlies are all obsessed with the adaptation of North and South. So I would really like to watch it and if any of you out there know where I can get my hands on the episodes, help a girl out and let me know how to watch North and South. Next up, I read Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And I'm not going to talk about this book too much because I have an entire reading vlog. Go check that out. I will link it in the card. All in all, I decided to give this book three and a half stars because it was not bad, but I was a little bit disappointed. So the title character, Carrie Soto, is a retired female tennis player who decides that she is going to come out of retirement to defend her title as the greatest female tennis player in the world. This takes place in the same interconnected universe as Taylor Jenkins reads other books, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, Malibu Rising, and Daisy Jones and the Six. I thought this book was good, but considering how much I love TJR's other books, it did feel like a bit of a disappointment. And after a while, I felt like the plot was getting a little bit repetitive and I was kind of just ready for the book to be over, to be honest. I will say though, I definitely enjoyed the feminist messaging about women in the world of sports. And there were a lot of parts of this book that did resonate with me as a woman. I definitely think a lot of the social commentary was on point about what women and women of color experience. And you know, kudos to Taylor Jenkins Reid because had she not written this book, I never would have picked this up. I don't care about sports and I don't understand how tennis works. So I think, you know, she deserves credit for keeping my interest as long as she did. This is a book that I would not have read if anyone but her wrote it. Then the next book I read was another four star read, Beautiful Little Fools by Jillian Cantor. This is a feminist retelling of The Great Gatsby following the female characters Daisy, Jordan, and also Myrtle Wilson's sister who is named Catherine. Myrtle Wilson is the woman who was having the affair with Tom Buchanan. The book begins when they are all young, continues through the events of The Great Gatsby and then the aftermath. I'm gonna spoil The Great Gatsby here so if you don't want to hear it just skip to the next book. But a part of this book also follows the detective who is investigating the murder of Jay Gatsby. Everyone believes that George Wilson is the murderer but a diamond hairpin is discovered in a nearby bush casting suspicion onto Daisy, Jordan, and Catherine. I enjoyed the plot. I was thoroughly engaged. And I think that the way the author wrote the characters' backstories, to me, felt really plausible and authentic. I think my biggest issue with this book is it falls into the trap that I feel like a lot of feminist retellings do. And obviously I am a feminist. I love reading feminist books, but I don't really like it when those books make all the women really good and all the men really bad. I think this book kind of glosses over the flaws that Daisy and Jordan have and makes Gatsby and Nick much worse people than they were in the original book. I just wish that Daisy and Jordan had been a bit more flawed because women do not need to be angels to be worth our sympathy. And it just in my mind didn't line up with how they act in The Great Gatsby. Next, after months of working through this book, I finally found time to finish reading The Time Traveler's Guide to Regency Britain by Ian Mortimer. This was another four star read for me. This is a nonfiction book about the Regency era in Britain. And it is written as if 
you were a time traveler going back to this point in history, what would you need to know about society? How would you fit in? Where would you stay? What would you wear? What would you eat? What are the social norms that you have to follow? So I think that's a really interesting way to approach a historical nonfiction and make it more immersive and engaging. The one thing that disappointed me a little bit, and maybe that's on me for not knowing this going in, is though the book is called A Time Traveler's Guide to Regency Britain, it's not talking specifically about the Regency, it's talking about the Georgian era at large, which took place from roughly the late 1700s to the early to mid 1800s. The Regency era was a much smaller window of time within the Georgian era, so saying it's a guide to Regency Britain is a little bit of a misnomer. It really should be a guide to Georgian Britain. I was hoping for more information about the Regency specifically, but you know, I guess that's my bad for not knowing that going into the book. I did think this book had a lot of interesting information though, and I tabbed a bunch of pages to go back to later. This author also has time traveler's guides to other eras of British history, so maybe I will pick up his other books someday. If you're looking for a really interesting general overview of Georgian Britain, I think this is a good book to try. Next, I read another nonfiction book, How to Write Killer Historical Mysteries by Kathy Lynn Emerson. I gave this book four stars as well. So as you may know, if you watch my writing videos, I am currently working on the first draft of a historical mystery novel. And while I was just Googling, I discovered this book as a free PDF and decided to read it. All in all, I'm really glad that I did. This book is designed to help you write your own historical mystery novel. It details the planning process, how should you decide what era you want to write about, what research do you need to do, how do you create your characters, and even some tips on how to market and publish your book, though some of this publishing advice is a bit outdated because this book was published, I think, think in 2007, I'm not exactly sure. I think this book gives you a lot of food for thought. And what I really enjoy is Kathy Lynn Emerson references what other historical mystery authors have done to help you make decisions about your novel. This book is not exactly telling you what you need to do to write a historical mystery. It's more so telling you all the different things that you need to think about during the writing process. For example, who's your main character going to be? You could have a main male character who works for whatever the police force was in that era of history. If they didn't have an established police force, what was the procedure for solving crimes? You could write a main female sleuth, but then you also have to think about how is she going to work around the patriarchal constraints of her time period. Or you could write a man and a woman who sleuth together. In that case, you need to think about what makes them a good team and what co um, complementary qualities they're going to have. It just goes on and on like that, giving you all these different questions you need to ask yourself and reflect on to write a successful novel. If any of you out there want to write a historical mystery of your own, I definitely recommend checking this book out. And hey, it's a free PDF, so what is there to complain about? Definitely let me know if any of you would like me to send you the link. I would be happy to share. The next three books I'm going to talk about I read for a vlog, so I will be very brief. I read three thrillers, the first of which was Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney, which I gave four stars. So this book follows a married couple, Adam and Amelia Wright, who go off for a secluded getaway in the Scottish Highlands. They are staying at this very spooky converted church in the middle of nowhere. It is believed that Amelia won this getaway for them at her office raffle. However, strange things begin happening and it turns out the two of them might have been lured there for for a more sinister purpose. Another added element of this book is that Adam, the husband, suffers from face blindness. This basically refers to when a person is unable to recognize faces. So Adam can look at his own wife and not recognize her based off her face. I thought that was a really interesting plot element to add to a mystery thriller. 
I really enjoy Alice Feeney's books and this one was no exception. I think the first reveal really caught me off guard and it was very cleverly done. In retrospect, I feel like I should have known something was up but I was so engrossed I really didn't think about it. My complaint and the reason I didn't give this a full five stars is I feel like after that first reveal the rest of the book just couldn't maintain that wow factor that the first reveal had. So the ending was not my favorite part of the book. I didn't feel like it was as exciting as the earlier reveal. The next book I read for that vlog was Invisible Girl by Lisa Jewell. I ended up giving this book three stars. This is another mystery thriller that follows several characters. One is Sapphire Maddox, a teenage girl with a traumatic past. Her child psychologist is this man named Rowan Fors, and when their therapist-patient relationship is terminated, Sapphire has a hard time moving on and begins watching Rowan. We also follow Rowan's family, primarily from the perspective of his wife, Kate. They have two preteen or teenage children together. I forget exactly how old the kids are. And the other character we are following is this man named Owen who is currently living across the street from the Forrest family. He is living with his aunt after being fired from his job due to complaints of sexual harassment. And while he is sitting at home unemployed, he is sucked into the online world of incel forums. Sorry if the camera angle changed, I had to answer the phone, but I am back now. Anyways, all in all, I thought this book was fine, but I did not think it was super memorable. I did like how Lisa Jewell was able to write characters that I could sympathize with. There were characters in this book that I definitely felt compassion for. However, I feel like the ultimate resolution to the mystery, like it made perfect sense, but there was no surprise or shock factor. And that's what I really want in a contemporary mystery thriller. And the final book I read in that vlog was The Whisper Man by Alex North. This book follows multiple characters as well. One is a widower named Tom who moves into the town of Featherbank with his son. And we are also following several detectives who are investigating the murders of young boys in Featherbank. The murders are are very similar to murders that were committed by this serial killer known as the Whisper Man many years ago. And so they are looking into a possible connection between the two crime sprees. And at this same time, Tom's son begins to hear someone whispering at his window. This is why the killer was known as the Whisper Man, because he would go up to the bedroom windows of his young victims and and whisper to them, which is so creepy. It gave me the heebie-jeebies. And I had to check to confirm that all my doors and windows were locked and no serial killers were going to come get me in the night. <laughs> Maybe don't read creepy books before bed. <laughs> Again, I don't think anything that happened in this book was particularly shocking, but I read this book around Halloween and it gave me the vibes that I was looking for. It was very creepy and sinister. Just the concept of this killer, the Whisper Man, is so scary. And there were some moments where I could just feel the suspense building. I definitely think this makes a great spooky season read and I really enjoyed it though I can't give it a full five stars because I wish there had been a plot twist of some kind. I also didn't love the perspective of the female detective, Detective Sergeant Beck. It seems based on what I saw on Alex North's Goodreads profile that she is a recurring character in his books but I just felt like her perspective wasn't really necessary and I didn't feel like she was fully fleshed out as a character so there was no personal investment for me. 
Next, I read The 13 Problems by Agatha Christie, which I gave three and a half stars. This is part of the Miss Marple series, and it is basically a series of interconnected short stories told by members of this group who refer to themselves as the Tuesday Night Club, and they share with each other stories of crimes or murders that they have heard. All in all, I thought this book was pretty enjoyable, but I can't say it was super memorable to me, and that's why I only gave it three and a half stars. I enjoyed it while I was reading it, but I feel like it's not going to stick with me forever. I also am not a huge fan of mystery short stories, just because, as you can probably guess, I really like it when mysteries have twists or surprises, and I think it's very hard to pull off a plot twist in a short story. I think you really need a longer format to be able to have that shock value. I have no regrets about reading this. It was pretty easy and all in all enjoyable. The next book I read was Moonflower Murders by Anthony Horowitz, the sequel to Magpie Murders. I gave this book four stars. All in all, I really enjoyed it. However, I don't think I liked it as much as Magpie Murders. Susan Ryland, the main character from the first book, is contacted by a couple who own a hotel in England. Their daughter has recently gone missing and they want Susan to help figure out what happened to her. Alan Conway, the deceased author whose books Susan once edited, visited the hotel many years ago and the hotel and the people in it served as inspiration for one of his Atticus Pund novels. The couple's adult daughter had been rereading the book to see if it contained any clues to a real-life murder that happened at the hotel many years previously, and she said she found something in the book but was never able to tell anyone what she found because she disappeared before she could share what she knew. I did enjoy this book and once again I really liked the book within a book format. We are following Susan during her investigation and we also get to read the Atticus Pund novel that was inspired by the hotel. I did not like this one as much as Magpie Murders. Maybe I went in with too high expectations because originally I wasn't planning to read this book. I felt like Magpie Murders didn't need a sequel but I saw so many people say Moonflower or Murders was even better than Magpie Murders and I went into this book fully expecting to give it five stars based on all those comments. I think maybe my expectations were a little bit too high so while I still enjoyed it a lot it was a little bit disappointing because I was expecting it to be better than Magpie Murders and I didn't think that it was. It was still a good book though, don't get me wrong, and I think it's really clear that Anthony Horowitz is a mystery lover and connoisseur. His passion for the genre I think really comes through in his books, and I would be open to reading more by him in the future. Lastly, I read The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell. I think it's my biggest disappointment of the year. I gave this book three stars and I went into it fully expecting to give it five stars for it to be one of my favorite reads of the year, if not potentially one of my favorite books of all time since I loved Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell so much. However, it just couldn't live up to my expectations. This book follows Lucrezia de' Medici during her arranged marriage to the Duke of Ferrara. If you have ever read the poem My Last Duchess by Robert Browning, Lucrezia and her husband were the inspiration for that poem. A lot of the book follows Lucrezia adjusting to her new life as a duchess. We are going back and forth between two timelines, and in the present day timeline, Lucrezia becomes convinced that her husband is going to kill her. Now Maggie O'Farrell is an absolutely beautiful writer. Her writing is so descriptive, and just some of her metaphors and word choice I find so stunning. However, I thought this book was boring. It was so slow. And when I heard the description of the plot, I was thinking this was going to be a favorite of mine. It's about the Medicis. It involves a murder. It has feminist themes. It has me written all over it. But 
I feel like this book was really lacking on plot and a lot of the book was just building up to stuff instead of stuff actually happening. I wish the book had spent more time developing some of the side characters, particularly Elisabetta and Jacoba. I believe that was his name, Jacoba? I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. I don't speak Italian. I think they could have been really interesting characters if they were introduced earlier in the story and Maggie O'Farrell fleshed them out more. I really didn't connect with Lucrezia, to be honest, which was disappointing. And the other problem I have with this book is this book is supposed to be a feminist novel, but I feel like really no female character was described in a overwhelmingly positive way other than Lucrezia. And I wish she could have just had one positive, supportive female relationship. You might say, well, what about Amelia, her handmaid? But I didn't feel like they were really friends. I felt like they were just a mistress and her servant, and Amelia wasn't given a whole lot of personality or development. I also felt like the ending was very, very obvious. I immediately pegged where it was going, and I can't say I really loved the choice. I won't spoil it, but if you go to my cozy reading night video, I do have a spoiler section where I share my theory about where the book is going. And yeah, I was 100% right. I guessed that immediately. I thought it was super transparent where the plot was going. I don't know, maybe I should have even given this book a two because I really didn't like it, but I don't want to be too harsh. Maggie O'Farrell's writing is still absolutely gorgeous. I really like her writing style. I just felt like the book itself was really lacking. I wish there was more plot and more development for all of the characters. It was just a big missed opportunity in my opinion. I really thought I was going to love this book. And unfortunately, I didn't. Maybe I'm being a little bit harsh just because I was expecting so much from it, but I was very, very disappointed by the marriage portrait, I'm sorry to say. So everyone, those are all the books that I read in September and October 2022. Have you read any of the books that I read in the last two months? If so, do let me know in the comment section what you thought of them. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you're still here watching at the end of this video, how about posting a red heart in the comment section? If you liked this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more from me. I post new videos every Wednesday and Sunday. My social media links are down below if you want to follow me on Tumblr, Instagram, or be my friend on Goodreads. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you have a glorious rest of your day. Bye, and I'll see you next time.